Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks to those of you who are here in person. Nice to see a lot of friendly faces, so this will be a lot of fun. And thanks for those of us, those of you who are joining us uh, via Zoom as well. So we're going to do this primer on inherited retinal generations. It's kind of a lead in, in part to the MPG talk that a group of us are doing a little later on. We're going to finish by 9.15, so there's time for the transition to the MPG meeting. And Emily and I are planning to tag team this a bit, so I'm going to get started, and Emily will take over, and we'll finish up together. So this isn't really good. These are disclosures for both of us and a picture of the members of the Alcohol Genomics Institute in the pre-COVID days when we could actually get together. We're looking forward to doing that again. On the Ocular Genomics Institute, we think of as a translational medicine institute. We're interested in developing precision medicines for inherited eye disorders in general. There are four co-directors as listed, and 14 investigators in the institute itself, and about 20 affiliated faculty. And we really try to work on translational medicine from patient care to genetics to disease pathogenesis to therapy. And we'll try to cover that, mainly the genetics piece and the primary data and the more translational part in the MPG meeting itself. With a laser pointer, you can't move forward. So inherited retinal generations are the topic for the primary spring and part of the MPG session. They're important causes of vision loss, the most common cause of vision loss in working age people. They're genetically diverse with over 280 different disease genes that we'll hear about. And they affect somewhere between 1,000, 1 out of 1,000, 1 out of 3, people worldwide with uh, affect people across the age spectrum. One of the things that makes them advantageous to study and for potential therapies is we can really observe retinal health effectively. So I thought I'd go through what disorders look like a little bit to set things up for the discussion. This is a picture of a normal retinal with the optic nerve here and retinal blood vessels. This is an autofluorescence view looking at the layer underneath the neural retina, the retinal pigment epithelium. And that's what it looks like when it's healthy. Um, you can get an amazing view of the structure of the retina, kind of like in vivo histology by using a technology called optical coherence tomography which takes a cross-section of the retina with light, looking through the macular here at the center of the retina. And you can see the different layers of the retina with the inside on the top and the outside of the eye on the bottom. This thicker band here is the light-sensitive photoreceptor cells. So if you look at a model of that, um, we're actually seeing histology, right? This is nuclei of photoreceptor cells. Here are outer segments and here are retinal epithelial cells that interdigitate with the photoreceptor cell. So we can tell if those cells are healthy or sick and assess disease status. If everything's healthy like this, you get a full visual field. I mean, that's the picture in the upper left corner. With two different sized lights, the person can see very well with peripheral vision. You have retinal disease, and you can tell right away that the pictures above look different. Visual field changes. Now to the smaller dimmer light, that visual field is very constricted. So in the evening or night, this person will have a lot of trouble getting around because their vision would just be a little on it. And that's because the light sensitive cells in this layer are lost purposely, just retained in the very center. So the only thing that's left are the central cones. So they're not as sensitive to dim light. Sometimes with some disorders, the layers of the retina are present, but they're not working. This is a picture of someone with severe early onset retinal degeneration, which historically has been called labor congenital amaurosis. They have very poor vision, count fingers kind of vision. They can't read any letters on the chart. If you hold up your hand close to them, they can tell how many fingers you might have up. And so that's despite the presence of these cells here. So their cells are still there, but they're not working well. So that kind of structure function dissociation, and that's a potential opportunity for interventional therapy. If we could intervene here with a precision or genetic therapy and reactivate these remaining cells, maybe we could restore them. And I should say that's been done 
with some forms of gene therapy. Multiple clinical trials are now in progress. We're going to talk a little more about that in the MPG session. When disease is more advanced, this is the end stage kind of disease. You can see the sputter receptor layer is all gone. And this person really has no remaining functional vision. They can probably tell if the lights are on or off and that's about it. We want to prevent this from happening. The way to do that is to understand the genetic cause of disease. As I mentioned, genetic therapies look very promising for treating inherited retinal degenerations. This is mainly AAV based gene augmentation therapy. About two thirds of patients have diseases and genes that are amenable to that kind of therapy. The remaining third who have mutations of genes that are too big for AAV therapy or dominant disorders, they would be gain a function mechanism. Other modalities are being studied, like CRISPR Cas9 mediated editing therapies or antisense oligonucleotide. And we're going to talk a little bit about those efforts, efforts to develop those therapies in an early clinical trial of those. MPG session. It's usually delivered by subretinal injection, as shown in this picture here. Some, excuse me, sometimes by delivering drug into the vitreous. There, it's an exciting time in our field after initial proof of concept. There's yeah. multiple, there are multiple clinical trials for potential therapies going on. As listed here, we're very lucky in the Oxford Genetics Institute to have several very talented clinician scientists to work with Rachel Huckfeld and this commander and I work together on the clinical service with our genetic counseling colleague, including Emily is gonna talk shortly. Um, and we're thrilled to be doing some of these trials at Mass Ioneer and looking forward to additional approved genetic therapy products. And Emily, this is where you're gonna take over. And it does look like this, these buttons are working. So um, dive into a little bit more about the genetic. We'll start with a case to set us up here. Um, so patients who come into the inherited retinal disorder clinic or the IRD clinic go through a number of different clinical evaluations. So that includes retinal imaging, electroretinal physiology, visual field testing. And all of these um, tests together can help come to a clinical diagnosis of an inherited retinal condition. So in the case of this patient, the, um, all the clinical findings were consistent with a diagnosis of a rock home generation or a um, But a clinical evaluation alone and the diagnosis of RP is not indicative of a specific genetic form of disease. So there are a number of different genes that can cause the same phenotype or present similarly. Additionally, we know that the same molecular diagnosis can also result in different clinical presentations. And as pictured here, our fundus images from three different patients who all have the same um, molecular cause of disease. So uh, homozygous mutation, same homozygous mutation in a gene that causes recessive RP. Um, so in addition to being phenotypically heterogeneous, as Dr. Pierce also mentioned, these are genetically heterogeneous conditions with over 280 genes that have been identified to date. Um, and this Venn diagram is a nice representation of the phenotypic and genetic overlap. Um, and if we focus in our RP, we can see that a significant number of genes have been associated with RP. But in addition, there are a number of these genes that can be associated with other um, phenotypes as well. Specifically, if we look at periphery 2, risk been reported with RP, coronary dystrophy, and macular disease. So given this genetic heterogeneity and phenotypic heterogeneity, we really need to do broad-based genetic testing as kind of our first-line diagnostic testing. And what that really means is looking at all of those known inherited retinal disease genes, so the 280 genes through a multi-gene panel, focusing on um, really an exon um, capture. And when we do that, we can identify a genetic diagnosis in about 60 to 80% of patients. And that's really driven based on the phenotype of what our diagnostic field is. Um, from our own clinical experience, the most common genes that we see from patients who come into our clinic carry mutations in the genes of APCA4, HPA2A, PRPF31, RPGR, and Clifferin2. Um, and our experience here is pretty common, what's been reported within our colleagues in the community, as well as what we know about these particular genes is they're the most common genetic causes of these inherited retinal conditions. It's interesting to note though, that many of the other patients that we see um, have very different genetic causes of disease. So it's really one or two patients that we see a year who will have um, a mutation in, in one of in greater than 40 different genes that represent our cohort. If we take a snapshot of um, one year within our practice, what our diagnostic rate is for newly diagnosed patients, 
it hovers around a 60%. So it's about a third of patients who can't find their genetic cause of disease for. So if we get back to our patient that we started with, that 36-year-old patient who has a rod cone degeneration, um, that person underwent diagnostic testing and unfortunately we didn't identify their genetic cause of disease. So they fall in this one third that we can't find their genetic cause of disease. So what's the next step? How do we identify these unsolved families? We think a proportion will be solved by um, non-coding variation or structural variation in the known disease genes. And you'll hear a bit about that today. Um, but we'll also, a small proportion will be solved by new disease genes. And by small, we mean it probably hovers around 2%. And the reason that we say that is if we look at the rate at which new disease genes have been identified over the last several years, I think you can start to appreciate that it started to plateau. So why, yes, there are still new disease genes to be identified. We think it will not, um, these new disease genes won't solve a significant portion of these unsolved patients. Um, so if we dive a little bit deeper into that one third of patients, what do we see? Well, about 13% of these patients carry a single variation in a gene that causes a recessive form of inherited retinal disease. And so the kind of ask, leads to the question of, so patients who carry a single high impact variant, so loss of function variation or a known pathogenic mutation in one of these recessive IRD genes, could there's um, the second mutation be a non-coding variation or a structural variation to be their cause? And so can we test this? And we did. So um, to test this hypothesis, we looked at a cohort of patients and families who have a diagnosis of early onset retinal disease. As Dr. Pierce said, traditionally this has been called LCA. And we identified six families who all had lost single loss of function variations in the gene RPGRIP1, and their second, second variation in this gene has not been identified. Full exome sequencing had been done for these patients and families and didn't identify a new candidate gene that we think was the underlying explanation. Um, so we embarked on whole genome sequencing to look for non-coding variation as well as structural variation that could be that um, account for that second allele that we were missing. And so when we did this, for three of the six families that we studied, we did identify entrotic variation that we think solved their, um, was the underlying explanation for them. And so this one family highlighted here in which a single um, rare variation, as you can see, um, mutation two listed, um, a deep intronic variation in intron 11 was identified. And so we used a MIDI gene assay to assess the functional impact of these splicing variants. And in brief, this assay involved transfecting HEC293 cells with the region of interest of RP grip one including the wild type as well, the region that included the mutation, and then assessed for splicing defects. Um, so as um, it can be seen here in the plot, so the red plot indicates normal splicing that occurs and the green the splicing that event caused by our um, variant. And what we found was that our um, new variation that was identified um, activated the inclusion of a cryptic exon, which can be seen here. Inclusion of that exon then harbored uh, that cryptic exon harbored a uh, nonsense mutation that resulted in nonsense mediated decay. Um, so this ultimately ended up being the solution for this patient. For three of the six families, we identified structural variation that ended up being their explanation for disease. And again, one family highlighted here. In this particular family, um, a suspected tandem duplication was identified that included what was thought at the time to be um, exon one and exon two. On closer examination though, the breakpoints for this variation, um, the five prime breakpoint was upstream of the predicted exon one. So the duplication would have included the promoter and thus it wasn't totally clear how this du duplication would result or if it would result in dysfunction. Looking though at transcriptome analysis from normal human retina, we identified that there was um, um, an un, a new exon or an exon that hadn't been annotated upstream of the initial first exon. And then when we looked at Tim Cherry's data, which is a tax seek and ship seek data, identified open chromatin region and transcription binding factors that were again, were upstream that hadn't been identified before, which is outlined here in this gray box. Um, so given our SV data, in addition, in addition to the transcriptome data, 
and Tim Cherry's data made us realize that um, the, the transcript model that we had for our transcript one was incorrect um, and that there was actually an exon that we needed to add in where transcription would begin. So given this new transcript model, in fact, the duplication that we identified of quote unquote exon one and two would in fact result in a premature stop coda and thus be deleterious. Um, so I will, uh, so the next step would be, well, we can identify non-coding variation or structural variation as the cause of disease for patients, but what is this other 19%? What can be um, solving these patients? Great. Thanks, Emily. That's a nice, clear story. Should we stop and see if there are any questions at this point? Good question. Um, I'm curious if, if I interpret correctly, it sounds like many of the um, forms of this disease are later onset, but it, it's not people experience low vision or vision loss from their earliest ages. It's more something that happens later. If Given that they have a mutation, why is it that that effect is realized only later rather than in the earliest stages of development. Right, yeah, this is a question that I think comes up in for many inherited disorders with later onset. And I think all we can hypothesize is that the variants identified cause photoreceptor or retinal, retinal dysfunction, but not cell death early on. So that people are asymptomatic, but that as the visual system gets more impaired and more photoreceptor cells die. As they age, they become symptomatic. That's obviously a bit of a hand-waving explanation. It doesn't quite add up with what I was saying earlier about structure of function dissociation, right? But I, I think we just have to say some cells are working, but not out of the game yet early on, but that they die off or dysfunction further with age. Does that address your it does, yeah. Thank you very much. And just a reminder, I'm happy to hand the microphone. So a quick question along the same lines. Um, so some diseases are aggressive in human body, some are not. So building on that question, um, no, I forgot my question. <laughs> I was formulating it. <laughs> um, let me just start from again. So building on that, so some are aggressive, some are not so aggressive. So are there cases that, no, I know my question. So is, are there studies going on such as biomarker detection? So we can do an early intervention. So can cell death be arrested at that point of time or some IRD disease are such a unique case that that may not be possible. So I'm thinking from cancer angle that a lot of studies, early detection, biomarkers, we can stop the progress, do the same thing. Is IRD in the same realm or it's a bit different mechanism? So even early, detection may not be, we, we may, you may not be able to arrest it. So Sudeep, it's a great question. It's a bit of a softball because I know you know a bit about this area. We're obviously very interested in detecting disease early. I don't think there are definitive data yet, but our impressions from clinical studies, clinical trials of potential genetic therapies indicate that earlier treatment results in better outcomes. So if you have a younger subject with less disease, more intact retina when the genetic therapy is applied, they seem to have better outcomes. We need to, that, need, that question needs to be evaluated more systematically, but that's certainly my impression. So finding a patient who's affected early would be fabulous. We predominantly at this point rely on clinical biomarkers, right? The OCT imaging we showed before is in a sense a biomarker. It's a non-invasive test. So much result in a clinic with symptoms. They can have that study and you can tell are their photoreceptor cells affected or not and potentially then get a genetic diagnosis as Emily was describing for a genetic workup and consider potential therapies and that's actually how our clinical practice works. The challenge is for people with recessive disease and no family history they don't know to look for them so it's hard to do pre-symptomatic evaluation at the moment. The place where that, I think at the moment, that might work better is in dominant disease, where most of the time people have a family history. Parents are very aware that their children are at risk. We tend to avoid pre-symptomatic genetic testing, potentially a topic to discuss. But in theory, if you wanted, you could either do pre-symptomatic genetic testing at that point, or 
use of biomarkers you're suggesting beyond the exam biomarker. And I think you were, I think you mentioned cancer biology, like cancer biology, we're certainly looking hard at cell-free RNA and DNA circulating in the blood to see if we can find biomarkers of retinal health. To be honest, at the moment, I would think that could be applied more towards tracking response to therapy than early diagnosis. But if it eventually worked out well, we found something that was easy to detect, we would love to employ that as a biomarker. Does that address your question? Yes, thanks. All right. So I guess I'll move on here. So as Emily pointed out, we do pretty well finding genetic cause of disease for patients. But we have this category of 19 or 20% shown in white here, where after sequencing exons, known disease genes, we have no hint about the genetic cause of disease. So the question we want to ask is, could people have two non-coding mutations in a known disease gene? They were obviously doing gene discovery experiments to try to find a small number of new diseases that remain. But we really think a lot of this is going to be non-coding variation in the known disease gene. That's pretty hard. You do whole genome sequencing and you have a family affected by disease. You have too many variants, too many rare variants to find the cause of disease from the whole genome data because there are so many rare variants in the interim. But how do we solve that problem? And what we tried to do with help of Repital Bronstein, a postdoc from a postdoc in the lab, is combine two approaches to solve this problem. We started this a number of years ago. I think many of you are familiar with the success of this approach, combining data from whole genome sequencing with RNA sequencing from a rel relevant tissue to combine those two orthogonal sources of data and come up with a genetic diagnosis. And that's been reported to work for inherited disorders like muscular dystrophy, as well as some others, where you can get a biopsy of the relevant tissue without being too invasive. For the retina, you can't do that. You can't biopsy the retina. So how do we solve this for retinal disease? And the same question would come up for other disorders like other neurodegenerative diseases. How do you solve this problem of not being able to biopsy the target for relevant tissue? And what Revital worked on was using a combination of induced pluripotent stem cell derived retinal organoid, which I'll describe to you, for RNA sequencing and whole genome sequencing data. Rather than start with a totally unknown family, because this is a new technique, we decided to try this out in a family we were pretty sure we would get the result if the experiment worked. So we picked a family with cone dysfunction, meaning the cones in the center of the retina don't work, so they have poor central vision, can't detect color. And they had a known variant in one of the known cone dysfunction genes, CGB3. But we couldn't find any other variants in that gene. We could have taken the approach of looking for non-coding variants in CGB3 directly. We wanted to test this idea of would a combination of whole genome sequencing data and RNA sequencing data come to a genetic solution. So we made we did whole genome sequencing for all five members of the family, including both affected, and we made induced pluripotent stem cells from all the children in the family to make induced make induced pluripotent stem cell derived retinal cells. We looked at the whole genome sequencing data, even using the segregation data for all five members of the family. There were over 3,000 rare variants present in over 640 genes. There was no way to come up with a genetic solution again just from the whole genome data. So that's one of the things we want to point out. It's, we're still at this nomad data of help. We were to redo this analysis. I think today, instead of these data from a couple of years ago, this number would be smaller, but there'd still be way too many variants to come up with a genetic solution just from the genome sequencing data itself. So what tissue do we use for RNA sequencing? Could we use blood or skin? And unfortunately, the answer is no. We did that comparison. We looked at all the known, the 280 known inherited retinal disease genes and their expression levels in blood and skin. And you can see against the background of gray of the expression levels in normal human retina, blood and skin do not express many of the known inherited retinal disease genes and the levels of expression are not really reflective of normal levels. Skin does better than blood, but even so, it's still less than half of the known retinal disease genes expressed. So that's why we wanted another source, this relevant tissue idea for the RNA sequencing. So we turned 
of these IPS derived retinal organoids, which is actually a pretty amazing technology, as has been done for a number of other tissues. You can take pluripotent stem cells, and if you treat them right, turn them into your tissue of interest. In this case, with the help of David Gamble, Wisconsin, we're able to turn them into retinal pigment epithelial cells and these little retinal organoids, which really are little retinas in a dish. If you section them and look at them, they get laminated structures just like the normal human retina with photoreceptor cells as well. It takes six months to grow them in culture, but it turns out to be worth it. So if you look at the expression of the known and heritable disease genes in an IPS derived retinal organoid, you can see that the representation of expression compared to human normal retina is much better. So we use those data to compare to the whole genome sequencing data from our family of interest. When we evaluated, and actually Sudeep evaluated the gene expression and splicing in the RNA sequencing data from the three children in the family, we found 180 different splicing events and 143 genes. So we're starting to get to a smaller pool. But the real question is, what's the overlap with the genome data? It turns out very gratifyingly to be one gene. We identified a rare deep intronic variant in exon 14 of the CNGB3 gene, which, like the one that Emily described in RP group one, activated the inclusion of a cryptic exon through the transcript, which leads to a premature stop. So that solves this family and I think demonstrates proof of concept in our field. Uh, you know, consistent with what's been reported in other fields, that this combination of whole genome sequencing data and RNA sequencing data can lead to solutions. We are applying this to families that have no hits in known disease genes and trying to come up with our first solution with two non coding variants. We're not quite there yet. Having learned how cumbersome this is, we're also working on other techniques to interrogate the effects of intronic variants. In New York Sonic variants on splicing, for example, high throughput way, and hopefully we'll be able to tell you more about that in a future presentation. So we're getting towards the end of the sort of main content, and Emily's going to pick up and tell some interesting stories about other places to look for genetic causality. Any additional questions at this point? Those 19% which we always want to target, which are missing, you mentioned about CNVs, SVs. Um, what about gene fusions? And unfortunately, in the current body of work, I haven't seen too much work on, uh, is it impossible to have, or it's just that because uh, we, we are not able to detect them properly with the short read, but hopefully with long read, we may be able to find these fusion genes, so dosage over, overdose or read-throughs. Sure. So I, I, I would have put this question in the category of more complex structural variants, right? Whether it's, so it's not just a duplication or deletion, but maybe an inversion or some kind of rearrangement, which are hard to detect. You know, the tools for detecting those with short read data using the whole genome sequencing data are getting better. Like Tarkovsky's group has developed GATKSV, which is very effective for many of those kinds of variants. You're correct that eventually additional deployment of long read sequencing technology, I think will help that. And I'm sure that there are examples of disease for inherited retinal diseases as well as other Mendelian diseases caused by where the, one of the pathogenic alleles at least is a more complicated, more complex structural variant in the gene, absolutely. All right, we'll take a look from here. Um, great. So I'll kind of um, end with some lessons learned or solutions that have been there and, and worth us continuing to go, look back into. Um, and so we've heard a lot today about really cool stories about finding down coding variation, structural variation, um, but wanted to get back to, well, actually variation that lies within the exons that we may have missed through um, certain analyses. And one being um, thinking about um, family history and how informative that is when we analyze a family. Um, and so what we found within our work that we're trying to be more mindful of is that in families where we see two generations that are affected, while this could be consistent with dominant disease, we've seen a number of families where it's um, the underlying explanation is pseudodominance. So 
um, recessive disease in both generations. And so these are three different families um, here in which we've observed this. So the first being a family with ABCA4 related disease. ABCA4 is a common genetic cause of recessive um, macular disease. Um, so we've seen a number of families with pseudodominance due to mutations in this gene. Not entirely surprising because actually some of the variations in ABCA4 are very common within the population, have a high carrier frequency. Um, as the last mutation listed here has a nomad allele frequency of 1300. And so there's actually 10 homozygotes that are in nomad. Um, so not uncommon for common variation or variation with high carrier frequency um, to be paired up with more absent or rare variation. Um, but our, um, what we've seen with ABCA4 isn't unique to ABCA4. So we've seen sort of dominance in genes that cause more rare conditions, such as um, BBS1, which causes Barty Bedell syndrome, so a rod cone dystrophy, but also other systemic concerns, um, including uh, diabetes or kidney disease. Um, so in the family, we had a mom and two sons who were affected. Mom carried a common missense variant, um, known pathogenic variant, again, common allele frequency within the general population, but also had a nonsense mutation. Um, it, uh, her partner was a carrier for this common um, missense variation and the sons were homozygous for that variation. Um, and lastly, again, not being the, you know, the ABCA4 case and the BBS case certainly note about the high allele frequency, but we have seen this with rare alleles. So in our last family with um, ARSG, we're two, again, two generations affected. The three alleles at play here were all quite rare within the population, so two absent and one has a very low frequency within NOMAD. Um, so again, lessons learned from our practice and continuing to be mindful that um, family history, while helpful, is not always indicative of what the underlying gene or inheritance pattern might be. I'm, I'm like, there sorry, was uh, the there was a question in the Q&A, um, <clears throat> which is how is the interplay of complement gene variants um, that seem to play roles in AMD um, relate? How, does, how do those complementary common variants relate to inherited retinal disease? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we typically actually don't see those common variations being cause of these inherited or Mendelian forms of disease. Um, whether or not they're at play or modifying um, um, the primary genetic cause of disease, certainly a possibility, but um, we don't see them contributing to these Mendelian forms of disease. Thank you so much. Um, and kind of the last point is to um, point out that there are a handful of genes that we know can cause inherited retinal disease that can cause both dominant and recessive disease. So this is a demonstration of a, a common gene or this we know is associated with these two inheritance patterns, RP1. Um, so initially this gene was identified to cause dominant forms of RP uh, due to loss of function mutations that cluster in a certain part of exon four. Over time though, variations were identified in um, other regions of exon four and then um, exons two and three, and those variations were associated with recessive disease. So again, reminders that genes that we were initially identify as being associated with one inheritance pattern can in fact maybe cause other inheritance patterns as well. So we may see more of this going forward. Um, so in summary, um, We've discussed today that we really can identify about a third of our patients or two thirds of our patients genetic diagnosis um, for an inherited retinal condition. So it's quite good, but there's still a third of our patients where we are not sure what their underlying genetic explanation might be. And as we discussed with you today, we think a portion of those patients will be solved by non-coding variation or structural variation um, in the known inherited retinal disease genes will be contributing to these diseases. Um, as we've discussed a bit along the way, really working towards identifying a genetic diagnosis for all of our patients is extremely important as we think about treatments and interventions, genetic treatments and interventions on the horizon and are very optimistic that more types of these genetic-based therapies will be available to our patients. So knowing their gene will empower patients to know what types of therapies they will be eligible for. Um, but this also um, certainly lends to the fact that we need to be identifying other genetic, ther other therapies that are not always related to the specific gene as potential treatments as well. Um, and so, you know, all of our 
really our patients are counting on us. So I think that's the joy of being able to continue to be in clinic and connecting with our patients, um, helping to identify their genetic cause of disease and when we can't, um, providing them their research expertise um, in order to find that genetic explanation. With that, I will thank a large number of contributors um, and collaborators um, and happy to take any more questions. If there's anything to see. Thank you so much. So, um, are there any questions in the in the room or Sarah or any questions in the Q&A? There's Maybe nothing we'll currently in the Q&A, but one thing I was just wondering, and this may come up in the following session, is um, you know, you've, you've proven um, the utility of integrating RNA-seq and, and your approaches to gene, pathogenic gene uh, prioritization, but what are you going to do next for your next unsolved cases? Um, and do you have ideas of kind of further ways to, to parse through these many, many rare variants that we get from genomes to find the ones that might have um, disease relevance. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to answer, and then Eric, you can add in as well. So I think um, as we pointed out with the CNGB3 case um, is that we do find a lot of um, intronic variation that we're not entirely sure how to um, sift through. And so while prediction programs only get us so far, we need a functional way to be able to assess these variations in a quick way to understand what their impacts might be. Um, and so as Eric mentioned, I think working through high, a high throughput assay in order to be able to screen these types of variants quickly um, and then them whether what their predicted effect will be will help us better understand and more quickly analyze whole genome data for these patients. Uh, no, I think that's that's exactly the answer I would give. And the only thing I would add is we're well on the way towards developing those high throughput assays, mainly with uh, King of Yakovska's work, developing a beautiful high throughput splicing assay, which can be applied to both deep intronic variants and near exonic variants. And, and I wouldn't say quick, but in a relatively effective way, help us identify pathogenic intronic variants. And that's also building a lot on the work of one of Kenya's postdocs, Ricardo Sangamana, who really showed us the way of this in the ABCA4 gene and demonstrated the importance of these barantonic variants, which had previously been underappreciated. So we're, we're hoping we're on the path towards addressing the question of variants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so all. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks to our speakers. So. <laughs>